Thank you very much. So this is a joint work with Tao Shu from CUHK Shenzhen and Jasmine from Virginia. Uh, our combined experience in M&A is very limited. <laughs> so our paper investigates winner's curse in uh, mergers and acquisitions. So winner's curse in general refers to a situation where the winning bidder uh, tends to be the one with the most optimistic evaluation of the assets. Therefore, tends to overestimate and overpay uh, for, uh, for buying a particular item. So there are two key conditions for us to observe the winner's curse. The first one is the asset or the item uh, at least has some common value that is the same to all the potential bidders. So for example, I'm willing to pay much more for the picture of my daughter compared to like others. So, but that is not a winner's curse because I get private value from that item. So winner's curse, like, the common value is like the same to everyone else. And there has to be uncertainty about the value, like the, value, uh, the, the, the estimation, the uncertainty about the estimation. So uh, Baserman and Samuelson 1983 said if a $1 bill is auctioned off, like here, no one is willing to pay more than $1 to buy that item because there is no valuation uncertainty or estimation. In contrast, if we have a, a, a jar of full, full of $1 bill and we have a room of participants wanting to buy that jar and uh, assume the range is between $15 to $35, and the actual amount is 25. So the one with the most optimistic valuation, like the guy who thinks there's 35 uh, $1 bill in there, will end up paying 35 and expose realize he overpays and regret. So that's like the, the general uh, concept of winner's curse. And what we, a, a very important point here is the overpayment is not caused by like agency issue. It's unintentionally overpayment because of the too optimistic valuation of the asset. So we're going to investigate like winner's curse in the in merger acquisition because it's uh, intuitively appealing. Um, and early on, we have some theoretical prediction like bidders tend to suffer winner's curse. And also we have uh, a great literature showing bidders on average tend to overpay and they suffer poor performance. And some of the prominent uh, studies have, have been done by a prominent researcher sitting in this room. And mainly the literature shows overpayment is associated with like agency, agency issue or empire building. So the empirical evidence on winner's curse or behavior bias is rather limited and very, uh, is mixed. Like the evidence is not uh, clear at all. So to illustrate the, the, the bidder's estimation. So we have a, like asset and bidders are competing to buy this, this target and we have like two potential bidders. Bidder one's estimation is right here. Bidder two's estimation is on the left side. Let's see, here is the, the target value. The target firm is going to reject the, the bidder's bid because it, it, it undervalues the target asset. On the other hand, if this bidder is very smart and sophisticated, the rational bidding theory predicts this bidder should rationally account for the winner's curse and lower the ex ante estimation. So this bidder should be like right here. However, that's like in theory, if everything is perfect, we should not on average observe bidders are overpaying, when, even when the uncertainty is high, if the bidder are very smart at ex ante anticipates and accounts for the winner's curse situation. So it's an empirical question for us to test. In our paper, we are going to look at a very uh, unique setting based on uh, a sample of around 400 M&A deals where the target firms hire two investment banks or more than two, two or more investment banks. And each investment bank provides valuation, like the, the company, the target firm company valuation. And we measure the disagreement between these banks for the same target firm and use that as an uncertainty measure and see how that is related to the bidding premium and bidder performance and the M&A synergy uh, in, in the deal. So the, the, I'm going to give us a specific example about how investment banks provide the valuation estimates and how we construct the measure. 
But uh, this measure, I want to emphasize, has several major advantages compared to the traditionally used uh, disagreement measure in the literature. For example, the most commonly used is analyst vocab dispersion. And we know analyst vocab dispersion is, is constructed based on like one quarter ahead or one year ahead, like earnings per share. That's just like one dimension of a uh, performance metric. But here we're talking about the valuation of the entire firm. So second, sometimes we'll use like uh, return volatility based on historical performance. And also we have like uh, the change in institutional investor like breadth. So those measures uh, that are traditionally or very commonly used in the, in the literature, but we argue these measures are n less appropriate in the context of mergers and acquisition. So our measure first directly captures like the, the target valuation as a, a, a firm like, overall. Then second, more importantly, investment banks as well as potential bidders, they in fact have access to the target firm's confidential information that is not publicly available. So those valuation by investment banks incorporate those private and confidential information. And third, incorporates uh, potential synergy creation in the deal. So this is a direct measure of disagreement, like valuation disagreement among investment banks hired by the same target firm. So I want to emphasize like the same target firm because in a sense we're controlling for deal fixed effects. Because the same target firm provides the same set of information to different investment banks and they come up with valuation that appear to be different. So uh, the overview of our uh, finding in case I'm running out of time. So we find evidence that is uh, consistent with uh, winner's curse in m as We find when investment bank valuation disagreement is high, bidders tend to pay much higher premium. And in that case, bidders have lower uh, announcement return in the short run at the deal announcement. They also have lower announcement in the long run. And we also find that like, synergies created in those deal is significantly lower compared to like the deals with uh, less valuation uncertainty. And that has implication because the results suggest like bidder that suffers winner's curse tends to outbid the actual bidder who can create the highest energy. So this winner's curse uh, phenomenon, in a sense, creates misallocation of the, uh, like negatively affects the, the asset allocation or resource allocation to the overall economy. And we're trying to differentiate if the overpayment is caused by like agency problem versus the behavior bias because those two mechanisms are very different. Uh, the agency issue like bidders knowing they're overpaying but because they want to you know, ma manage a bigger size of firm like um, Empire Building. So they might uh, think it's easier for them to overpay for investors like to, it's harder for investors to see through if the valuation uncertainty is really high. So we try to differentiate those two uh, very different channels or mechanism by investigating like cross-sectional analysis, focus on like the, the, the uh, better CEOs tend to suffer more from behavior bias measured by Mamandir and Tate's uh, over confidence measure versus governance measure. And we again find strong evidence this is due to like the behavior bias introduced by winner's curse. So the setting. So our setting, I, uh, I mentioned before, we focus on very specific uh, kind of unique setting because in the US, if a firm is buying another publicly traded firm, the target firm needs to disclose merger documents uh, which contain important information for their shareholders to make a decision. So within that uh, doc merger document, fairness opinion or investment bank valuation needs to be disclosed. So we collect deals that hire two or more investment banks and we get the valuation uh, provided by the investment banks. As we teach like MBA or undergraduate students, investment banks, they tend to use, like the most likely used valuation methods are comparable company analysis, discounted cash flow and comparable transaction analysis. So we also, so th th this, uh, this is part of my uh, dissertation chapter that uh, 
early on look at the trend of uh, target farms using multiple fairness opinion. And in that paper, I show in the very early, like 1990s, rarely like 5% like of target farms seek like multiple opinions, but that trend grows substantially toward the end of our sample period. We see like 15 to 20%, over 20% of target farms start to seek multiple opinion, which provide us a very unique setting to see like whether investment banks disagree on the same target farms valuation. And this is a specific example. So this target farm hired Morgan Stanley and PJT partners, like both investment banks provide valuation. Uh, and this, Morgan Stanley, we can see like the valuation range based on, so those are the same valuation technique. So the first one is selected company analysis or like multiple analysis or peer firm analysis. So the lower end, they typically provide a range of valuation, and the lower end is seven, the higher end is $10.75. The other investment bank, the lower end is six and 10, the higher end is 16. So you can see like they, they do have disagreement. And the second one is selected transaction analysis. Uh, Morgan Stanley, the devaluation range is $9.50 to 14, and the second bank, PJT partners provide like 910 to 2385. So how we construct the disagreement uh, measure, uh, we, we construct three disagreement measures. The first one is like we take the midpoint for each bank, for each valuation, we average the midpoint. And we do the same thing for the second bank. Then we compute the dis, uh, dis dispersion or standard deviation for the midpoint scaled by the target stock price prior to the merger. So we do the same thing on the lower end, we also do the same thing on the higher end. So those three measures are not surprisingly highly correlated. So our sample, we start from 1994 because that's the first year uh, we can access uh, merger documents electronically from Edgar. We end our sample period in 2020. Uh, and of course, we require target firm to hire uh, more than one bank, so we can construct the disagreement measure. Uh, we end up having like 462 M&A deals, and this is a rather small uh, portion of the entire like public firm population. So we have like about 5% of the total public target, but economically, they count for over 20%, because those uh, like larger deals tended to hire more than one bank to provide uh, uh, you must, like valuation analysis. So it's a summer statistics about the three disagreement measure. And we can see using the same set of information, providing valuation on the same target firm, the disagreement is non-trivial. So the midpoint disagreement is about 10% relative to pre-merger uh, stock price. The max is about 15% and the lower end is about 9%. So the first analysis we, uh, we've done is to investigate like our disagreement measure, the valuation disagreement measure, how, that, how is that related or associated with traditional disagreement measures as well as some firm characteristics. So we see, really we don't see a lot of uh, firm characteristics that tend to explain the like, investment bank valuation. This is not super surprising. Like the, the, the way we measure the disagreement, we control for, essentially we control for, uh, control for like firm or deal fixed effects. And we also see like the traditional disagreement measures are positively, but none of them uh, is statistically correlated with uh, our uh, disagreement measure constructed by investment bank valuation. So here we, 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 all, we control for traditional measures, and we see the disagreement. All of the disagreement measures are significantly and positively related to deal premium, either measured by offer price or measured by abnormal returns around uh, the M&A announcements. So this slide I have to give uh, credit to Micah, who uh, suggested us to control for the selection. Um, so this, we, we do this is because target firms do not randomly seek a second opinion. Uh, it's very likely they, the reason they reach out to a second opinion is because they think their valuation certainty is high. So in this case, we have to control, we have a selection problem because we, we only include the deals that we observe with multiple investment banks. 
and we need exogenous or instrument variable to control for that selection problem in the Heckman model. And what we come up with, we, we acknowledge like no instrument is perfect. We try to find exogenous variation and the instrument we use is the peer firms. So the concurrent demand for fairness opinions. Like in the, in the time when this, this target firms, industry peers seek second fairness opinion that increase the demand and also increase the cost. Because the peer firms are seeking multiple opinions that increase the cost for this focal target to seek a second opinion. And we expect that is uh, uh, negatively related with the, the use of the second opinion by this focal target firm. And that's what we find, like the concurrent demand is significantly negatively related to this firm's uh, likelihood of seek a second opinion and control for the selection bias, our results remain essentially unchanged. So we move to investigate the bidder return. This is a five day around announcement as well as the long term return over one to three years. And we see the disagreement measure <coughs> interacting with premium because only for bidders who fail to account for winner's curse, like in the, present of, uh, in the presence of high uncertainty, the bidders still pay high premium that is likely capturing the winner's curse. So that's why we interact with the uncertainty with premium and we find uh, bidders like when uncertainty is high and bidders paying high premium have significantly lower returns in the short run and in the long run. And merger synergy, again we find those deals create less synergy compared to other deals <coughs> indicating the resource misallocation. Like the, 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 the bidder who could have created more synergy seems like not winning in this case. So here is uh, our attempt to differentiate between behavior bias versus agency. So if this is agency, we tried a few like governance measure, institutional ownership and some uh, uh, literature showing if you have more institutional investors, the agency cost is, uh, is lower. And if you have a CEO who is overconfident, then the, the likelihood of uh, having winner's curse is higher. So again, the results suggest uh, the winner's curse or the overpayment when uncertainty is high is induced, is induced by behavior bias. To conclude, so our paper use a pretty specific setting, but we hope the results can speak to several different literature. So first of all, uh, apparently the results speak to M&A literature because we show like the winner's curse were in the, in the presence of high valuation uncertainty, bidders tended to pay higher uh, valuation, pre higher premium, which is consistent with uh, winner's curse prediction. And also those deals, for, from bidders' perspective, they have lower return and they have lower overall uh, synergy uh, creation. So in addition to the m and literature, we hope to speak to the general behavior finance literature and showing even in the most significant economic events like m and activities, like bidders, we don't seem on average they uh, account for winner's curse. So third, our results speak to like the informativeness of the corporate filings in general because uh, the, like accounting literature tends to suggest over time we see corporate filings get longer and longer but they become less and less informative and specifically there is a debate on the use of fairness opinion. So on the one hand people say fairness opinion is just a, a piece of garbage because you would have no problem paying an investment bank half million dollar to provide a valuation range suggesting that the price is fair. So fairness opinion is basically useless. It contains nothing, no information. So here we're showing not only the fairness opinion valuation, but their disagreement on the valuation is in fact very informative. So in a sense, the results speak to the usefulness of fairness opinion and the disclosure of uh, corporate filings in general. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And our discussant for this paper is Henri Cervais, who's quite in front of me. Thanks. Hey. Well, all right. Um, Let me find the slide somewhere. 
Great. So thanks to the uh, organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss this, uh, this very interesting paper. Um, I had it on PDF, then they all came in together. So the, the, what's the big question and what are the answers? So the, the question is, is there a winner's curse in takeovers? If you look at earlier work, looking at measures of uncertainty or looking at the number of bidders, um, the evidence seems to be you know, mixed or, or certainly weak in, in favor of winner's curse. And so the authors are saying that maybe these, these metrics that were used previously uh, did not capture valuation uncertainty uh, as well as, as the new metric that's being uh, developed. And so this new metric, uh, as Ting Ting explained, is based on uh, differences in valuation when multiple investment banks are used to value the target. And so based on that, uh, what do they find? They find more investment bank uh, disagreement leads to higher premiums and uh, higher cars for the, for the target also leads to uh, lower bidder returns when they pay higher premiums, so that seems to be consistent with the winner's curse. Uh, and there's also a welfare loss because uh, synergies and premiums are negatively related. And so, um, and these effects are then stronger for overconfident managers, so suggesting that overconfident managers are perhaps the ones who suffer most from the winner's curse, and so this supports the winner's curse. It looked better when it was a, a PDF. Uh, yeah. um, now, first question you have to ask, of course, is, is whether takeovers are perhaps the, the right place to, to test winner's curse, right? You need common value auctions. Now, there's, of course, common value about the, the target, um, but maybe not about the synergies, right? Uh, the bidders then generally receive a signal, right? The way these things get modeled, they receive a signal. Then they bid. The bidder with the highest valuation likely overpays uh, if the bid that they make is equal to their valuation. And so greater uncertainty will indeed uh, worsen the winner's curse if the bidders do not take this into account. And so the fit, you know, the, the, the way we talk about the winner's curse in general is there is some auction for, you know, or leases or something, right? When, when nobody has a, a value established. Takeovers, I mean, in my view, only partly fit this scenario in the first place. Um, the standalone value of the target is, of course, common value, but, and particularly in this case, they, they look at public firms, so we actually have a value, right? There is a market price, so it's not that there is, in that sense, uncertainty about this value and we all have to bid for it. And then, of course, the synergies are not common value. Now, that, that doesn't mean it's not interesting to look for overpayment in mergers. I'm not sure it's, you know, it's necessarily, uh, you know, necessarily winner's curse in that manner. Um, now, probably you've, you've all, I mean, this is an M&A audience, so you've probably all seen this before, but maybe it's useful to, to kind of take a look at what these fairness opinions look like. Of course, they're written up, et cetera, but usually in the pitch books that investment banks present to the board, they, you know, they put the, you know, one page, which people call the money page or the football field page, and this is what these things look like, right? So you have various valuation approaches. You always, always put also the 52-week trading range because the board wants to see where, where we are in that. You've got these ranges based on what? Based on some multiples, based on EBITDA or revenue multiples, uh, and you know various, uh, and then using LinkedIn or or, um, or analyst projections because this was LinkedIn's valuation done by LinkedIn's uh, investment bank catalyst partners, um, and so then they put these ranges there. You get a little dot as to where you were trading before, and then you know they decided to buy the company at 196, and that kind of looks like, you know, it's maybe towards the high end of the ballpark. That's what these things look like. And so what do the authors do? They take these highs, they average it, but then they find cases where there's another bank giving advice, it was not the case here, and then compare the average of these highs to the average of the highs of another bank, computer standard deviation. They do this for the highs, they do this for the lows, and they do this uh, for the median. And so the first, the first thing that they have to explain a little bit is why, why this measure is indeed superior, right? Um, you, know, uh, you know, so th they, they make three points. So first, there is more information uh, than in traditional measures of uncertainty. But I think if that's the case, well, you can combine various measures of uncertainty to come up with a, a good one. You know, it's not necessarily the case that as a result, this one is, is better. There is the argument that they receive private information from companies, but of course all investment banks will get the same information. So the only reason that they will differ is because they use the same information and make different assumptions, which companies they pick, you know, and then you know, there's a 
got a paper on that, which discount rates that they use, which multiples that they use, do they use analyst data in addition to that. Um, but it is not the case that necessarily this private information you know, is something that, that, that helps because everybody does get the same private information. What you're really capturing is these assumptions, but that may be fine, right? That's the uncertainty you want to capture. Um, but wh when, I look at the, when I look at this uncertainty though, I think why, why are we taking the highs, the medians and the lows, averaging them first across all their techniques and then taking the standard deviation across various banks, why don't you just study that, that price range in, in and of itself? Because right, from, from, your, from, from, from the author's work, right, the, the disagreement between banks ranges from 9 to maybe 15%, depending on the metric. But if you look at the disagreement of, of a bank itself, if you look at the range of a bank, that's 60% of the offer price, and that comes from, from Kane and, and Dennis, right? So, I mean, these ranges are huge, right? I mean, you know, and, and people get paid for this, for saying the price is between, <laughs> between 156 and 238. Whenever I show this to my students, they think this is, <laughs> this is just unbelievable, you know? I mean, anybody can do this, right? <laughs> but, but at least, I guess, you know, in some cases this is narrower, in some cases this is wider. To me, that's the best metric of uncertainty, and then you don't have to stick to just 460 transactions where there are multiple investment banks. Then you can use all of the data, and surely this must also capture something about uncertainty. So, so I would at least like to see the results based on, uh, based on that range. Uh, there's also the argument that they use information on merger synergies. Now, I'm not 100%, and I'm not a lawyer, but I'm I'm almost certain that they cannot do this. I, I think if you work for the target, you can only use the target's data or analyst projections, but you cannot make assumptions about the synergies because you know, I think there is a, there, you, know, you, you get into trouble because if you use some synergies assumptions, the synergies are, are estimated by the bidder. I don't think they're estimated by the target. Now, you can check this, but my bet is that when targets are being valued in a fairness opinion, it's always going to be about a standalone valuation. It's not going to include the synergies, except implicitly when they look at um, comparable transactions, of course, because comparable transactions, they must embed some synergy. Um, so, and so I found it surprising, right, that none of these other measures of uncertainty matter. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm willing to buy that this measure is, is different and is, is perhaps better in some ways. Uh, but you can do more with it, I think, and um, uh, you know, and, and the fact that none of these other measures of uncertainty matter does that I mean winner's curse, you know, is, is now resurrected while here it was dead. Uh, you know, you, you you want a lot of proxies, right? And if one proxy doesn't work, then I think we need to understand better why that doesn't work uh, in that sense. Um, now you're not using any information on the bidder. The main reason is, of course, bidder. Bidders often don't disclose their fairness opinions because shareholders don't need to vote. But the, the information is disclosed in some cases, right? The, the Dave Dennis's work uh, shows this. And so at least it'd be interesting to compare and contrast sort of the, the results using the bidder's estimates with, with some of the target's estimate and see what, what we learn about the uncertainty uh, there. Uh, thinking again about the, the premium, because you're, you're studying the, the relation between these, these metrics of the winner's curse and the premium. I mean, in the end, I guess the premium is, is three things, right? It's synergies, broadly defined, right? That could be running the firm better, whatever it is. Uh, could be undervaluation of the target, of course. Uh, and then there's some agency, there's some deliberate overbidding. And, and in some sense, the way I think about the various reasons, I guess, Synergies, that's where I see overconfidence being maybe the, the main problem, right? You, you just think you're going to do so much better uh, with it. Um, deliberate overbidding, that's, that's agency, I think. Um, and then undervaluation of the targets, well, that could be superior information, or that's really where the winner's curse, I think, where, where your story of the winner's curse shows up. And so right now, all the weight is kind of put on, on, on undervaluation of the target, um, and you're even looking at whether the winner's curse interacts with overconfidence and agency, but it seems to me that these are two separate elements that, uh, that you can also study. Um, now, of course, uh, so you, you really need to control for all three, I think, in the premium uh, regression to get this right. Now, of course, what, what, what I've put on there is, is only the maximum premium, right? This is the most that could be paid now, of course, with agency, but, but even with agency, there must be some limit. 
But in some sense, the premium is this combined with some bargaining, right? How much, how much do I actually want to give away for this? And so I thought that maybe hiring multiple banks and then having a difference of opinion uh, between these banks might somehow proxy for how much bargaining the target wants to do. Because the target can always, almost always walk away. You know, you can probably put enough defenses in place to probably walk away if it doesn't come right. There are not that many hostile deals. And so maybe having multiple advisors just proxies for wanting to bargain, which of course I'm going to pay for because I have to pay fees twice. Uh, and, and I think, and so this is just an alternative story, and at least I think you, know, you should maybe think about this a little. Imagine that two banks give me advice, right? And one says 90 to 110, and the other 95 to 150. Uh, and the medians, you know, assume that, you know, so medians 100 and 105. And, and I'm the target firm, right? And there is the money page that's being shown to the board. And the question is, at which price am I going to sell myself as a target? Now, I bet if there are these two opinions, you know, I think board members are going to have a very hard time, you know, going below the median of the, of the highest bank. I bet you that, but, but I don't know, but it's, a, it's something that you can easily check for, right? You can, this is all testable. And so I wonder whether the measure that you have captures kind of the extent to which they're willing to bargain and perhaps walk away uh, from, from a transaction if they don't get uh, the higher price. Um, so, but you know, this, this would then say, you know, you see a higher premium for those observed deals, the ones that still go through uh, when there are higher valuation differences. So I think that would be interesting, uh, interesting to investigate. Of course, you know, it's, there is an issue with the counterfactual. There's one mechanical result. I don't want to belabor it too much. I think you, you also find it in other things. But of course, the, the premium is relative to the price 64 days ago. The measure of disagreement is relative to the price 64 days ago. If, you know, obviously, both are going to go up if, if the market moves up over that period. Now, you also find the results with cars. So I'm not too worried about this. But at least this result is, is a bit, there's, there's one mechanical effect. I have a bunch of other points. These, these are actually all minor. I don't, you know, I, I don't really have a lot major, uh, major concerns because I think it's a very interesting paper. I'll just, uh, I, I can pick out maybe just a few in, in the amount of time that I have. Um, I think it might be important to control for bidder experience, right? If you, I mean, presumably if you made a bunch of acquisitions and you've been hit by the winner's curse, I mean, maybe you will uh, learn from this. Given that you're looking at fairness opinions, it's probably also important to include the kind of the, a measure of valuation in the fairness opinion relative to the offer price. Again, Dave Dennis in his work shows that you know if, if the valuation that comes from the investment banks is is a, you know is a lot um, higher than the offer price, then then you know it's, this is a, this is good news for the bidder. So I think it's probably worth including that. Um, in terms of the instrument for, for multiple fairness opinions, I'm not sure why you're looking at the demand for multiple fairness opinions in the industry rather than just the, the demand for, you know, for fairness opinions in general. I mean, if, if they're busy, they're going to be busy giving two opinions, but they're also going to be busy giving one opinion. So it seems to me that that might be a, a, you know, a, better, a better bet. The last point here is, is one I think I, I really made already. Um, I think I'm actually going to, uh, to leave it at that. So overall, I think it's a very interesting paper. I actually learned a lot just going through it and, and preparing my discussion and, and looking at the literature. So I think it's very interesting. And, and my really only comment is that I think you, you need to maybe do more work defending this measure and, and showing why it's superior uh, and maybe contrasting it uh, with alternatives. But uh, I very much look forward to seeing the next version. Thank you. Thank you. you want to take a minute to respond?
want me to use that? No. Henry, I'm not a lawyer either. Um, I'm not a lawyer either, but, but you raise this issue about, about synergies, and I can just confirm, just, just in terms of talking about that particular point, um, that the information that's provided by bidders needs to be audited during the offer process, uh, and that needs to be done by an audit firm, and therefore there is some sort of rigor behind it and that is part of what they will be including in the fairness opinion. So, so the importance of synergies, I would agree, you know, is extremely important. That information is disclosed. Just to give an example, back when Kraft bought Cadbury, the first, the first that EY could come up with in terms of synergies was 625 million. Uh, less than a month later, they raised it to 675 because they were able to sharpen their pencils and do some more. It was a hostile deal. They had no access uh, to Cadbury. You know, and eventually it went up uh, to 800. You know, so it even climbs during the time, which is the last point I just wanted to make. I think you need to be careful and you need to look at whether, in fact, there's more than one fairness opinion that comes in um, and whether a different opinion, evaluation opinion, will come in over time. So just a thought. Oh, hi. Um, my name is Buda, but just a quick thought as well. Uh, just from my experience of working in an investment bank, I just wondered, you looked at two, um, two models, but I just wonder, w would it make a difference if you looked at DCF evaluation as well? You know, obviously. Oh, okay, because I saw two only on the... Oh, right, okay. All right, thank you. Just a quick comment. Um, just to follow up on one of Henri's suggestions, which was to try and exploit the range of the uh, individual uh, banks' fairness opinions, um, I think it makes sense also to maybe scale the range by maybe a, the median or the uh, mean or of those uh, estimates. And uh, then, again, you can potentially uh, contrast um, the uh, variability of the two uh, estimates in that way. Uh, Ting Tang, one thing that I was interested in is your kind of validation table where you relate your uncertainty measure to characteristics. And I was a bit surprised that it didn't load on things like volatility, for example, or even more surprisingly, it didn't load on the analyst forecast dispersion because effectively your measure is based off of the dispersion of some other analysts in the same bank in the M&A division, right? How, how much they disagree and the analysts in the equity division basically do, they're doing the same thing and so those two don't actually correlate uh, what what's 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 your thought on that Yes, m more uh, suggestion maybe than a question. So the, the winner curse is very specific into that. Uh, 
it's a mechanism by which the, the winner doesn't fully account for the fact that for the common value part he is the highest bidder. Okay, and he doesn't correct enough for that fact. So, in fact, the winner curve doesn't play for the private part of the synergies. It plays only for the common value part. And one set up classically in the MNA literature with whether we, where we try to discriminate between common value and private value is financial transaction by financial bidders and transaction by strategic bidders. So, in fact, you splitting the sample into two, you should find more robust or more clear results for uh, financial builders than for, it's, it, I think it's close to some idea of, uh, or some suggestions for Henry, but that could validate that the measure captures something. Are there any other questions from anyone? Okay, thank you all. Um, our next paper on the program is presented by Jared Harford. Okay, uh, well, I'll uh, add my thanks to everybody else, for, to the uh, organizers for continuing to organize a, a conference on, specifically on M&A and for bringing it back in person and for including this paper uh, on the program. It's great to be here and to get some, uh, some feedback. It may seem like a, a sort of weird uh, combination of co-authors, but we were all at Chinese U Hong Kong uh, at the same time, pre-pandemic, uh, Daisy and Feng Guan moved on, uh, but uh, and I was visiting there for a little while. So that's kind of how this this paper all got started. Uh, so in terms of the motivation, part of this is just sort of exploratory and descriptive. The part of the paper is, is just you know just be out there in front is, is going to be more descriptive than having sort of a causal statement to it. Uh, there's a lot of information in Symmetry about a deal value when a merger is announced, right? And uh, it, when you think about all of the different stakeholders that have demands for information, uh, and they all have heterogeneous demands, uh, and there's sort of costs and benefits of disclosure to meet these demands. Uh, so, you know, you've obviously got the shareholders on both sides of the deal, but you also got analysts. We've talked about regulators. Uh, rivals are interested in, in what you're saying about what, uh, why you're doing what you're doing and so forth. Um, and there's all kinds of aspects uh, that they're interested in. Motivation, synergy, financial projections, uh, you know, stuff about what you're going to do with the labor force, how you're going to integrate stuff, how the deal is going to be financed, all kinds of, of just sort of process, uh, uh, process issues with the deal. Uh, and so the managers are having to figure out what are they going to disclose, how are they going to disclose it, uh, what are the costs and benefits of disclosure, you know, and certainly there's, you know, disclosing certain things are going to, are, are going to maybe give, give regulators some ammunition and other things are going to maybe uh, be useful to your rivals and so forth. Uh, but we actually don't know a lot about this process, uh, partly because it's not, you know, it's not part of our typical machine readable databases of, you know, of, you know, the financial statements or the stock prices or, or so forth. Um, and so what we're going to focus on are uh, the conference calls that are held in conjunction with the announcement uh, of the merger. Um, these are actually voluntary. 
uh, that, that you don't have to hold a conference call. It's not like an earnings call or something like that. Uh, the format, as I'll talk about in a minute, is quite similar to the format you might be used to uh, from an earnings call where management speaks for a while, has a preamble, and then they take Q&A from uh, analysts typically. Um, these are typically hosted by the acquirer management. Often the target management is also on the call. In a, in a, in a small uh, minority of cases, the target management is technically the host. Uh, and they're, as I'll talk about, they're typically hosted either the day of the announcement or, uh, or the day immediately following the announcement of the merger. And that's going to be important to us because we're going to talk about uh, the calls that are sort of preset in the sense that the deal is announced and they say, and we're going to have a conference call about it, uh, you know, today or it's scheduled for tomorrow. So that gets around one issue that's going to come up, which is are they having the call because of the way the market reacted or were they going to have the call anyway? So that's, that's one thing that's going to come up. Uh, when it comes to a, the, a public public merger, so public acquire or public target, it's about 50-50 whether there's going to be an M&A call. Uh, the, it's going to turn out that, the, that you know, when you look at just all deals, that, which include lots of small private targets, then uh, it skews toward not having a call, but that's that's because there's a, there's a huge mass of deals that involve, you know, a public acquirer and some small private target for which they don't they don't even hold a hold a call. Um, as I said, it's it's similar to what you're used to in terms of an earnings call. It's interactive. Uh, after the manager presentation, it goes to to Q and A. Uh, you know, regulation FD. Right, investors can just log log in and, and listen as well. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of, a lot of communication, uh, and it's dynamic, and this is compared with press releases or, or SEC filings, and I'll talk a little bit later that we did compare the topics discussed uh, to the press release, and, and it is, it is uh, incremental and complementary to the press release. It's not just repeating what was in the press release. So uh, we basically are, are looking at you know, what is the information that's used by market participants to assess the merger transactions, and how are the managers balancing the costs and benefits. So the, like I said, part of this is descriptive, uh, and part of this is trying to get at, at some sort of economic insight into a, like a cost-benefit type of, of setting. So uh, as I said, these are voluntary. So there is a decision going on here in the background of whether to hold the conference call in the first place. And like I, I hinted at earlier, uh, you know, there are costs here because uh, U.S. being so litigious, you know, vast majority, like 90% of, of mergers are litigated. And anything that you say or is released or, or written down or, or said in one of these calls can become the basis of a future lawsuit. Uh, and then, of course, your competitors are listening, regulators are listening. So, you know, it's very hard to have a merger where you say, this is great, we're going to, you know, drive up prices and have massive profit margins. You know, the regulators are, are going to love that, right? Uh, and so you have to be careful about, about, you know, what you say about where the synergies are coming from and so forth. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you want the deal to get done. Uh, and so you want to you wanna reduce the, the information asymmetry in sort of a positive way to get analysts on board, to get target shareholders on board. Uh, you want to address these concerns and, and increase the probability that this deal is actually gonna, going to uh, get, get consummated. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're going to argue that in the background, and, and so for us, as, I, as I'll go through here, at some level the endogeneity is important because, uh, you know, why the managers choose to hold the call uh, is going to be endogenous to the value of the deal. And so, you know, if they have a better deal to talk about, they're more likely to want to talk more uh, about it, and they're more likely to want to talk about sort of verifiable hard information that, that supports the deal. Uh, and so the benefit-cost ratio of holding the call will be higher, uh, and so we're, we're going to see more calls for more high-quality deals. Uh, and so we are going to distinguish between, uh, and, I'll, and I'll get more specific about this in a minute, uh, sort of hard information, okay? And so this doesn't have to be just numbers. It has to be, it's something that's verifiable ex post. So they, they will, this will include numbers like financial projections, but it'll also include contractual issues, discussion of production locations, and so forth. 
versus soft information, which is unverifiable. So what was the motivation? Uh, you know, how is the cultural fit between the, the companies and stuff like that? Uh, so we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to split up the topics in this way and, and look at how these two things are, are discussed as well. And so the trade-off is gonna be that, you know, for the high quality deals, uh, it's gonna be, you know, there, there's a big benefit to discussing the, the hard information uh, and so the discussion of hard information uh, will be longer in uh, these deals that are, are uh, that, that the market reacts to positively. So in the background of this, of course, we have to have a way of measuring what are they talking about, right? So this, is, this has been the problem in the background. Why, why has this not been done many, many times in, in trying to understand mergers uh, is because you know, these, these are just people talking, right? So the nice thing is we now have a pretty long time series of these calls that are, that are now where the entire transcript script is captured, right? And so we can then, you know, basically process it using machine learning. And uh, we're going to use some techniques that have, that have previously been developed. And I'll, I'll go into this in a little bit of detail in the, in the time I have, but basically, you're presenting the algorithm with you know, this entire set of transcripts and what you, ha you only have to tell it and you really only want to tell it a little bit, um, otherwise you're kind of being a little bit too prescriptive in terms of what, what will come out of the process. And so you basically have to choose a number of, you have to say there's 20 topics. Okay? And, and you can play around with that, but so we said you know, there's 20 topics and the words that are associated with those topics are allowed to vary across industries. Go, right? And then the, the, the machine is basically taking the entire, the entire set of, of what's talked about and trying to fit a distribution of words over topics and topics over, over what are called documents uh, and optimize this and sort of come out. And what, what comes out is groups of words that it says, okay, here are topics, I've found 20 topics, here are these groups of words that define a topic. It, has, it doesn't know what to think of these topics. It's up to us to actually look at it and say, okay, this is a topic about production and operations. This is a topic about finance. So we give, we give these topics interpretable names. The machine identifies the, the, you know, the topics that exist and where they are. And um, let me just, before I get more into the, into the details. Uh, so just allowing it, the, this, the, this has been around for a little while. Uh, these guys sort of added the ability to allow the topic to, dis, to, to the words associated with the topic to vary uh, across industries, for example, or across some other aspect of the data. And so for different industries, it's kind of important to allow production and operation to vary. So basically the, the algorithm spit out this group of words, it said this group of words is a topic in the manufacturing industry, this group of words is a topic in the, in the service industry, and we look at it and we say, okay, these are production and, and operation. Uh, we gave it that name. So that's, that's where we jump in. Okay, um, so a little bit more about the, the process. So a document is gonna be a paragraph in the preamble or a Q&A uh, a pair in the Q&A session. Uh, so don't think of a document as like a big document, it's like a document is like a paragraph. Uh, and you can imagine that, you know, what, if you were reading this, this from science, uh, and you were going through with different colored highlighters and saying, okay, these are all the, all the words that go with, that are together in a biology topic, and these are all the words that are in a genetics, and these are all the data analytics words, and you kind of went through and did that, that's basically what the, what the algorithm is, is trying to do. And then it sort of identifies based on that what, what people are talking about. So this allows us to process more than 5,500 transcripts over a pretty long period. Uh, US public acquirers are doing a lot of deals. You can see there's not that many calls relative to those deals, but once you actually look at uh, deals with public targets, like I said, it becomes about 50-50. Um, like I said, we give it presentation paragraphs or Q&A pairs, that's a, that's a document. 
uh, there's almost 187,000 of those and about 8,000 unique words, right? You throw out all the stop words, you throw out stuff that occurs like, you know, Bob and stuff like that. Uh, actually, well, that, that actually, we do have one category that's like basically names and stuff like that. that you say. And you have to declare the number of topics. So you can think of what's really going on is this is just a massive dimensional reduction exercise to allow us to interpret what's, what's happening in these calls uh, at a large scale. And so, uh, you know, very briefly, you end up with, a, with 20 topics. We assign them labels based on the words that we see in them. Okay, and so, uh, you know, like te technology, digital content, um, financial projections, approximately pro forma, earnings, right? The assumptions, margin, higher, gr gross, lower, accretion, stuff like that, and, and so on. And so these are gonna be like the, these are the, the soft ones, the hard ones. These are one that we, a category we call like deal process issues. And then we have sort of this other area, which is a lot of the fluff that goes around in the, in the deals, like the, the general comments and the opening and the closing and the disclaimers, which tend to be very pro forma. <clears throat> so what do we find? Uh, so we find that basically deals accompanied by calls, again, that these are, the calls are sort of predetermined uh, that they're going to happen because they say, okay, here's the here we're announcing this deal and we're going to have a call, are associated with higher abnormal stock returns, including if we just look at the returns that happen after, uh, after the, the announcement day. So like the returns that are just associated with the call itself. So there is some information being relate, released in the call itself. So they are reacting to the content of the calls. Uh, rather than simply the existence of the call, and that's, that's coming partly from um, when we do, we have an instrument for holding a call, which is just basically your history of holding calls. So if you just tend to be a firm that always holds calls, um, then uh, we use that as an instrument. And then the reaction goes away. The, the, sorry, the association, the positive association goes away. And so it's not just is there a call or not, it's actually, like I said, this endogeneity is important. The fact that they are holding a call, they're choosing to hold a call suggests that something about their private information in choosing to hold a call is related to the value of the deal as, as, uh, as assessed by the market. Um, as I said, we do actually look at the topical distribution. We run the whole same thing for the for the press releases as well, the topical distribution is different uh, from what's in the press release. Uh, and the other thing is that they do seem to serve at least what you might imagine is their primary purpose of reducing information asymmetry. If you look at bid-ask spreads or you look at the merger arbitrage spread, it does narrow uh, after, the, after the call. Uh, so we do look at, at uh, the further at the association of call content and stock returns. So lengthier discussion of hard information is positively associated with the returns. Uh, uh, soft information is negatively associated. The, here this, the effects are stronger for the part that the management controls, like how, lo how long they choose to talk about hard versus soft information in their presentation. Uh, it's less for once the analysts say, okay, you didn't talk about the hard stuff, I want you to talk about the hard stuff. Uh, in the, in the Q&A, and again, the effects hold for returns that are just relative to the call itself, not, not uh, including the announcement return, which is before the actual call happened. Um, getting at that heterogeneous demand for information, so when you are going after a public target, you know, part of the audience is the target shareholders. You have to convince them, as we just looked at the you know, fairness opinions, you have to convince them that they're getting a good deal here. And the harder you convince them that they're getting a good deal, the less sure your own shareholders are that, that they're getting a good deal. Uh, and so that gets, a, it gets into sort of this tension in terms of, of how you release inf information and what kind of information you emphasize in calls where the target is public. Versus where the target is private, if the target is private, the, tar the shareholders have already agreed because they, they're the ones you were directly negotiating with, and so your audience is, is down to just the acquirer shareholders. And so we find that the positive association of the call and the acquirer announcement return is stronger for the private deals. There's actually some indication of a negative <laughs> impact of calls for the public target sample, and again, that's because the harder you 
you work to, to convince the target shareholders that they're getting a great premium, the less excited your own shareholders are about the deal. Um, it does have a, a significant impact on the completion rate. So when you've got a public target, uh, it increases the completion rate by 12.8%, which is 15% of the unconditional completion. Uh, most private deals already have a very high completion rate because you've already got the target shareholders on board, uh, but it still does increase the completion rate there. Uh, <clears throat> we did see that they do talk more about the governance issues, you know, what percentage of the ownership is going to each and how are the control and voting and what are the business complementarities in public deals. Uh, and the inverse mills ratio for holding a call uh, is possibly associated with the, with the discussion of this. So again, that suggests that there's something about the, the latent uh, man, uh, the manager's private information about the importance of these issues that's driving, uh, driving discussion of the, uh, driving holding a call so that they can discuss this. We do check tone, right? So people have done, who have looked at earnings calls have, have looked at tone for a long time. So we do also process the tone uh, and control for the use of tone. Uh, Perhaps not surprisingly, soft information is consistently presented in a much more positive tone. Uh, also, if you just break down the presentation versus the Q&A section, the presentation, which management controls, is, has a much more skewed positive than the Q&A. Um, but the market seems to see through this. So if you, if, you could, if you look at the effect of using positive tone to convey the soft information, that doesn't, in, that doesn't make the market react any more positively since it, re, it reacts relatively negatively to focus on soft information. Uh, and so we're not, we're not just picking up a, a tone effect here. And as I said, we also looked at the press releases. The calls do convey information that's different from what's just in the press releases. Uh, and um, the, the press releases actually focus a little bit more on soft information. So, uh, with 17 seconds left, uh, my takeaway, so the M&A calls uh, do release value-relevant information. Uh, they, especially with public, public deals, they address a lot of governance and process issues. Uh, the decision to hold the call and the topics that they focus on uh, does appear to be the result of a cost-benefit analysis around disclosure and the costs and benefits of certain types of disclosure. The market really does not like a focus on soft information and you can't fix that up but fix that by being super positive about your soft information, uh, but hard and verifiable information uh, does seem to work out well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. Great. Well, thank you so much to the conference organizers uh, for allowing me to discuss this paper. Um, my name is Peter Hasseg. I'm at Vanderbilt University. So we got a, a, a good overview of this paper from that presentation. The three questions I saw uh, that the paper was asking is why do firms uh, decide to hold these calls? What kind of information is being provided? So that's where the topic analysis comes in. We relate it um, to how it's valued through the announcement returns, and then does this value of information depend on the setting? So to give a quick overview of my discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I see the contribution, and then basically focus on these trade-offs and how it interacts with those topics, and then I'll, I'll end up um, giving a few additional considerations. Okay, so how I see uh, the contribution is, is really thinking about these trade-offs and uh, how it relates to the information of the topics. Um, and I think the setting that the authors have chosen is, is really ideal uh, to address the questions that they're after. So first, we know that they're voluntary in nature, so that's the, ex, uh, extensive, uh, uh, um, the extensive margin that we're interested in, so that makes it interesting. This interactive nature uh, builds in risk to disclosure, so that's going to get at this cost-benefit ana analysis. Um, should I hold this call and expose myself to this additional risk? We have multiple parties dictating the information um, that should be released, so understanding how that's going to dictate what information, uh, how the market's going to react to it, and what types of information are important to what types of deals. Okay, so in summary, um, uh, the interactive nature, the voluntary um, notion 
uh, of holding these M&A calls uh, is, is useful in understanding these costs and benefits. And so um, I think that the, the cost benefit component of this is what, what I found most, uh, most interesting and, and where I would push the, the authors a little bit more. Before getting into that, it was useful for me to just kind of set this up. So, you know, the first decision is I'm doing this deal. Do I hold the call or not? Okay, so that's our extensive margin. Once I decide to hold the call, I have two different outlets uh, to think about. So first, I have this presentation component where I'm deciding what information to release. So what topics am I going to talk about? What uh, amount of verifiable information uh, do I want to highlight? And then we have this interactive portion, which is the Q&A portion. Okay, so that's the intensive margin. Okay, so we've got these two margins, and very similar to the slide that uh, Jared had already put up. Um, trying to set up these, uh, these trade-offs will let me uh, get into this kind of uh, first point I want to make. So the first is about whether I hold this call or not. Okay? The benefit of that is I can reduce the information asymmetry so I can explain this deal to the market. Um, this is going to allow me to improve the deal completion rate, uh, which they show in the paper. At the same time, I'm exposed to risks, so this is reputational from um, the executive's point of view. Uh, we also have legal risks. If I come out and say uh, something that's untrue about the deal, I expose myself to additional um, legal risk. And then we have these competitors who are listening to the call, trying to understand how I'm going to take this deal and put it into place. Okay? From there, we decide what information um, to, to, um, to give to market participants. So first, we have soft versus hard information, which is the main category. So once we have these topics, we're going to group them into soft, or um, I called it spin. We saw from the, the tone analysis that that seems to fit um, uh, what they're actually saying. And then we have this hard or verifiable information. Okay, the hard information is important um, because uh, that is exactly where we get perhaps the, the, the strongest trade-off between reducing the information asymmetry and exposing myself to legal risk. Okay, from there, um, we also have this dimension of what is the setting. Okay, so what type of deal, if I'm pursuing a public target or a private target, these public targets uh, ha have a multi-party setting where the uh, private targets seem to be more focused. Okay, so I thought the authors were really smart uh, to take this one step further and to think about this multi-party setting because I think that that's perhaps where it's, it's, it's most interesting. One thing, pretty minor point, is, is I, I liked this part. Another way you might be able to, to get this one step further is if we think about the consideration types. Okay, So if we have a public-to-public -public deal, if the target shareholders are getting paid in cash, their relationship is going to end as soon as they get paid. Okay, so they don't care about what that, uh, the, um, the merged company looks like moving forward. So if we have uh, some stock consideration in the deal, then I might have a more vested interest in understanding how the company is going to look like moving forward. So that's just one dimension you might um, play up uh, as well. Okay, so as I alluded to earlier, my first comment is really going to think about these costs and benefits. And the paper kind of posits that better deals uh, should be more likely um, to hold a call. Okay? Uh, all I want to say is that perhaps it's not strictly monotonic in deal quality. And I think that that's going to allow us to perhaps have a, a, a deeper conversation about the cost and benefit analysis that's going on here. Okay, so if we think on the x-axis we have deal quality and we think about the cost, well it's very costly for me to hold a call if this is a bad deal. Okay, I'm going to expose myself to a lot of risk. There's, nothing, a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of good to say about this deal, so it's very costly. As we move on, we kind of get to this medium area. And luckily, these lines uh, uh, here I can take advantage of. So this mid or gray area is going to allow me to kind of explain the deal a little bit more. Okay? Once I get into kind of a very good deal, you know, it's going to flatten. But I'm always exposed to risk. right? I'm, my competitors uh, may observe there's always this legal uh, litigious aspect. Um, so I always have a, a cost to holding a call. Alternatively, if we think about the benefit, we're going to see a, a basically a mirror image of this. So there's not a lot of benefit for a bad call in this mid-gray region. right? Uh, I see a huge amount of benefit. I can come out. I can get ahead of the deal. I can explain it to investors. Alternatively, though, there are just certain deals where the market understands, hey, this is a good deal. I'm not going to be able to reduce information asymmetry, so my benefit there is not um, as valuable. Okay, so. For these very good deals, perhaps that benefit um, has diminished a little bit. And so what we would get is this net benefit where 
very bad deals, very unlikely. The uh, marginal benefit or marginal net benefit is increasing in this middle region. And then perhaps we have this non-monotonic nature. So I agree totally. Uh, in in a, a, a linear sense, better deals are more likely to hold calls. Um, <clears throat> but perhaps it's non-monotonic. And I think that that's going to be um, of interest. Okay, so why is this important, this idea that perhaps it's non-monotonic? And this is, you know, I don't know if this is true or not, so I'm just positing it. Um, but what's the benefit of trying to explore this channel? Well, the authors are going to focus on uh, the benefits of holding a call. Okay, so deal completion, uh, reducing information asymmetry, because those are things they can observe. The problem is that we have this, this aspect where if I don't hold the call, it's because it's very costly, so I can't observe those costs. When we acknowledge that it might be non-monotonic, well, then we can start to get at the, the trade-offs a little bit more. We can start to explore um, whether these costs are actually there. Okay, so I think that that's going to allow them to focus both on the costs uh, and the benefits. And I think that once we, uh, again, kind of can start to look at some of these costs, uh, that will allow us uh, to utilize more fully um, the, 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 the topic analysis, which is what I see as one of the unique aspects of this paper. Okay. A couple minor things um, that I was just unclear about. There's some institutional questions uh, that came up. So I know on some earnings call or annual, annual calls, um, the firms will use mechanisms to limit uh, the costs. So uh, our firm screening questions prior to holding this call. Um, so that might be one way to reduce the cost. And if there's any way to tease that out, uh, that, would, that would help highlight it. And then um, also, is there a different legal liability that, that applies to these uh, M&A calls relative to the SEC filing? Because what we're going to show is that they're, they're going to bring in more hard information uh, in these calls to help support the deal. But that might be because they can actually say what they want to say as opposed to what um, they're legally liable for uh, in the SEC filing. So just trying to understand those, those two minor points as well. The second big comment um, is, is really trying to get at the incremental information. Because what the, the, the goal, in, in uh, my view, of what the paper is trying to do is to say, well, let's take what they're talking about in these topics and relate it to how the market is reacting. So you want a very clear channel from what is new uh, in this, this conference call and, and how is it relating to how the market's reacting. So I think the first thing we have to deal with is, is basically just thinking about whether this is part of a bigger strategy. Okay? So again, we're trying to isolate the, the information content of the call, um, but where or how can we control for, for other uh, information? So CFO.com. When talking about uh, communications around um, uh, these merger announcements, say, you know, perhaps you can use media as well. And so trying to think, like, can we control for the other stories that are coming uh, out? There's other studies that also show that uh, management and, and firms will use unrelated, so unrelated to the, the uh, M&A deal, uh, announcements, these positive announcements to try to boost the stock price because we know, particularly for these public to public deals, the market uh, doesn't act, react favorably. Okay, so this is more about thinking about perhaps controlling uh, for other information so to help isolate it. To be a little more um, uh, direct in, um, in trying to isolate the information, the incremental information that comes out of the, the call, um, you know, how you show these, 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 uh, these distributions comparing the uh, M&A call to uh, the SEC filing or the public uh, press release. And so I was just wondering, to what extent is that being driven by uh, the Q&A versus the presentation? Does the presentation made um, uh, by management at the start of these calls just purely mimic what's happening uh, in these press releases or, the, or these filings? OK, so if that's the case, then perhaps you could um, focus more on the Q&A. Alternatively, I wonder if there's a way to try to isolate uh, unique information um, that's happening in these calls relative to these press releases or these SEC filings. So whether that's uh, strictly removing uh, sentences that are uh, very comparable and then rerunning this topic analysis, um, or if there's some deviation. So I, I like that the paper focuses on total information as opposed to relative uh, distribution of information, but maybe there's uh, one way to, to, to try and take advantage of that. Okay, so I've talked about this, perhaps emphasizing the Q&A is going to be important. 
that uh, interactive nature of holding the call and, and the fact that somebody's going to ask a question <laughs> is introducing information that perhaps uh, the firm uh, wasn't planning on, on releasing. Okay, so even if I sidestep a question that was uh, uh, that was asked by um, by an investor, the fact that that question was asked is releasing information. Okay, or incremental information, and then also thinking about um, what the time frame for uh, uh, how the market reacts. So we have this plus one to plus five window as, as kind of the standard. I thought, okay, well, if we're trying to say, you know, the call is happening, unique information is being introduced into the market, how does the market react? Then maybe tightening that window will give you some additional power to isolate uh, that information. So just something to consider. I, I, I'd feel comfortable even with plus one to plus two there um, if, it, if it helps there. Okay, and so what's a good discussion without uh, uh, of a, an empirical paper without talking about instruments? Um, and so my question was, what are the instruments really capturing? So we've got this idea that past call history is positively predicting uh, the likelihood that I use a call this time. So there are certain types of firms uh, that just hold a call regardless. Um, we also saw that no past deals are more likely to hold calls. So there's just, um, let me explain myself to the market as I kind of make this first deal. And so when I think about it, I think that the instrument is really capturing kind of the expected component of holding a call. And I would just offer up that there's kind of two ways um, um, to, to approach it from here. You know, the, the paper doesn't push very hard on, on causality. Um, and I think, you know, there are some weaknesses uh, to that instrument. And so I think that's reasonable. Alternatively, what, what you might consider is to just bypass this, this idea of an instrument and just think, well, if, if the expected component is, is um, getting at um, the known uh, reasons for um, holding this call, well, the, the, the residual is going to capture that unexpected component. Okay, and so in that sense, perhaps just using the residual, saying the residual is capturing the unexpected component or the strategic decision um, could be one, uh, one way to, to kind of back off that. Okay, and so, um, yeah, I'll leave those minor comments. Okay, so I did have some institutional questions about what the common uh, timing between these are. Again, really what we want to do is isolate what information comes from the call and how that relates to how the market reacts. There's a lot going on uh, at the same time. We've got the announcement itself. And so if we've got some, some time between uh, the announcement of the deal and that call, then we can look at the return uh, thereafter. And so again, just trying to think, and, and to the author's credit, they do look at calls that happened on day T, uh, T plus one. And so um, I think you know, that's where I feel a lot more comfortable um, with all of these, but just, just giving that some, some consideration. And then one thing that I thought would be interesting, is there any way to classify who is on the call and, and try to build out like, um, some of the claims of the paper about this multi-party setting and seeing uh, how, um, how the returns vary with, with who's on the call there. Okay, so. Just to conclude here, uh, it's an interesting paper that provides the first analysis of why acquirers hold these calls and what information is valued. I think the bigger question is trying to get at what the, the costs and benefits of talking about certain things are in these particular natures. So I, I think they've found a, a nice setting. Um, they've done a lot of work. The textual analysis is great. Um, and I think you know just, just buying into this idea um, that it might not be non or that the relationship between deal quality and, and likelihood of holding a deal uh, might be non-monotonic uh, can open up some, some additional um, questions and really utilize that, that topic analysis. So I'll stop. Thank you so much. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Jared, did you want to take a moment to respond? Okay. Uh, thanks. That was that was really uh, really super. Uh, lots of uh, lots of useful stuff to to take back to my co-authors. I really like the idea of um, the non monotonicity uh, idea and how we might be able to to get more out of that. Uh, and some of the other stuff about you know different method of payment and, and how that matters for the type of information, the sort of news media strategy, controlling for that. Um, all kinds of great ideas. So yeah, just thanks very much. Thanks. Okay, let's take some questions. First is Hi, Henri Servas, London Business School. Uh, <laughs> have to introduce ourselves. You, you said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, maybe you do this, but in terms of who the audience is, it may depend on whether this thing is up for voting or not by the target, uh, by the by the acquirer shareholders. Mm -hmm. okay, so because if if there's no vote, then you know, a lot of it is a done deal from their perspective, and then they're trying to convince the target. If there if it comes up for voting, they have to convince their own shareholders. I don't know if you've looked at. Yeah, that. we ha we haven't. I mean, that's a, that's a great point. Um, we haven't done. Uh, you know, is this going to cross? You know, so basically, these are always structured, right? So that technically, that they don't get to vote. The bidder shareholders don't get to vote on the deal. But if it's going to be enough shares issued, then they get to vote on that part. So that's sort of where the bid. And we haven't done that twenty percent threshold analysis yet. But I think that that's a great idea. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, Ron. Very interesting paper, Jared. Uh, just a few thoughts on other things that you might control for. Um, for instance, uh, you're looking at public versus private uh, uh, targets, but um, you might also look at public targets that are initiating the deals, uh, because obviously uh, there's less of a concern about uh, uh, approval not going through. And the same thing would be true for closely held target firms. Um, and in terms of uh, one of the points that uh, it discussed and made, um, separating um, the uh, looking at uh, what kind of financing of the deal is going on. If it's stock financing, it could have a lot of implications uh, in terms of approval by the uh, uh, the, buy, uh, the acquirers um, and. <coughs> So, again, do you want to oversell uh, <laughs> the, the transaction uh, um, in terms of it being a good deal for the targets or not? Um, the two other quick thoughts. Uh, you could analyze how, how, what happens to acquirers that have traded options. And I think it could be interesting to look at what happens to the implied volatility after these conference calls occur to see whether there's some evidence of some shift in uncertainty or asymmetric information. And finally, uh, for publicly held targets, um, you could also look at uh, the stock announcement effect uh, of them after the conference calls. Yeah, okay, great, thanks, thanks. These are all super ideas, thanks. Okay, are there other questions? Tim, Tim. So I just want to follow up on Harry's point because I had exactly the same thought. So in terms of like bidders catering to their shareholders, so if the deal issues more than 20%, there is an immediate need for investors to approve the share issuance. But even if the bidder doesn't issue 20%, but if there is a threat, like if the firm is more likely to subject to investor activism, like unhappy institutional investors might launch proxy fight in the next proxy season. So the, the bidder may consider that. Versus another firm, you have institutional investors like pro-management, then that might affect their like, incentive to hold a call or not. So I think that would be really interesting if, if bidders consider those like, short-term needs versus uh, medium-term, like if their position will be like, threatened uh, in the next proxy voting. Yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions? Eric. Yes, uh, if you want to maybe try to give some more causal taste to some research which is quite in the current mood, uh, maybe studying the time series variation of uh, the topic analysis and uh, its relation to uh, litigation risk because there must be some source of uh, exogenous shocks like past critical decisions or stuff like that that could impact uh, the, the time series of uh, topics that are addressed in this yeah. document. So that, that might be a strategy. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great idea. We haven't, we haven't looked at the time series variation in, the, in topics in general. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Jared. Thank you, well, thank you. Um, Peter. And thanks to all of you.